interest in uh, the programs that we have here at the uh, the Quabbin. Um, we've been doing a lot of stuff with uh, pollinators and nature, uh, at least I have um, for the last year. So I figured I'd end the year on that theme. Um, and it occurred to me as I've been doing, you know, study and research over the years, you know, like where do the pollinators go other than the ones that we know about in the winter? And I figured since I wanted to know about it, it might be something that uh, other people want to know. So that's the uh, that was the impetus for creating this program. Um, and then I uh, just have to want to say that this this scene, which I absolutely love, is. Um, is not from the Quabbin. I wish it was, but um, that's just, this is just a generic scene that I saw that I just thought was very fitting for, uh, has the winter trees and a road that kind of goes into question mark. So that's why I uh, put that up there. So um, let's get started. Like I said, we know what happens to uh, the hummingbirds and the monarchs. Those are the ones that everyone knows about. They uh, have their famous migrations, uh, both of them both the ruby-throated hummingbird, which is our only uh, native hummingbird up here in, uh, in New England, um, and the monarch butterfly, both migrate to Mexico, um, thousands of miles. Uh, they do that every year. They migrate down there to their wintering grounds and then they come back. Um, the ruby-throated hummingbird does also go down as far as Central America, um, which you can see from the, the green on this map. You've got the, the red, which is their breeding grounds, and then the green, which is down uh, Mexico, Central America for their wintering grounds. And then for the monarch, we've got them all coming down to virtually the, the same spot. It's the same area that they all go to in the winter time. So everyone knows about those and we're familiar with them, but what about everything else? Because we have lots of different pollinators. Those aren't the only two. And um, so we wanted to, I wanted to know where they went and what they did. I did get some uh, assistance in addition to my own research. I just want to give a shout out to uh, these, these people who um, gave me specific information. Uh, Michael Veit, uh, who's an expert on bees. Dave Small, who many of you might know, um, is uh, the expert on butterflies and moths. And Elise Stanmeyer, which is a, a, one of our DCR biologists, and she is a bat expert. So I just wanted to um, give a shout out to them that uh, I did get a lot of very useful and uh, cool information from them. So a little word about terminology. Basically in the winter time, the, one of two things happen. Either the animals move or they stay. Really no other options. So if they move, it's called migration. Um, which the definition of that is the seasonal movement of animals from one habitat to another in search of food, better conditions, or reproductive needs. So that's, that's pretty self-explanatory. The next three definitions are um, all kind of the same, but there's a little bit of difference. And I'm, I'm not going to really focus on that. Um, hibernation is sort of the general term that everyone thinks of where the animals go into a state of inactivity and that helps to conserve um, body heat and you know, other, other valuable resources. Um, but within the range of hibernation, there are also these other phases. Uh, one is called torpor and one is called diapause and different species go into those in different times. So again, they do have some differences, but uh, it's not really anything that is worth getting into for the point of this program. Um, but I just did want you to be aware in case, in case you're doing any of uh, your own research, looking things up, you might see these words thrown around. So you know that they, um, they do have a place in, in terms of, uh, of winter, uh, overwintering. So there are different types of pollinators. Um, most common ones people think of, of course, are your, your bees, your butterflies, and your hummingbirds. But there are actually lots of other critters that are pollinators. And um, so we've got bees and wasps, butterflies and moths, hummingbirds, beetles, flies, bats, ants, and mosquitoes. And I will 
talk a little bit about each of these groups, um, but uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on mosquitoes because let's be honest, we don't really want to talk too much about mosquitoes, do we? So uh, what I'll just say about them is that there are nearly 3,500 species of mosquito and very few of them actually die in the winter. Most species do hibernate either in the egg, larvae, or adult stage, and they emerge in the spring. So unfortunately, that is why we, we still sometimes see mosquitoes in the winter. Okay, and so another thing that I just, I just thought this was a cool graphic, I liked it. Um, I was kind of old fashioned looking. Uh, the taxonomical classification of animals, um, which is this really, complicated Latin name uh, classification, which I am also not going to get into for the purposes of today. I'm just going to talk about the order. So by, for each of the groups, I'm going to put the Latin name up for the order, but not for anything else. So, you know, I'm going to talk about bumblebees, but I'm not going to talk about each individual species, uh, family genus. So just so you're aware, the Latin names that you'll be seeing are for the order and um, and that's that's going to be it. So we start off with the uh, Hymenoptera, which includes bees, wasps, and ants. And this is actually the second largest group of insects in the world. And uh, according to the Smithsonian, this order is considered to be the most beneficial to humankind, um, primarily because of uh, active pollination of plants and ensuring the proper development of many fruits and vegetables, but they're also helpful in their actions of parasitism and predation on pest species of insects. So this is, uh, this is where a lot of the, the wasps come in as, a, as very beneficial because um, they're, they're very voracious when it comes to eating some of our other garden pests and they, uh, they deserve a lot of respect too. Um, just a couple of interesting notes that there was a publica publication in 1997 that recorded a discovery of a new species of tiny wasp that at that time was known as the tiniest existing insect. That is called the fairy wasp and it gets between 0.5 and 1 millimeter. But I've also seen other references to a particular beetle called the featherwing beetle, um, which gets to be like 0.325 to five millimeters, which is listed as the smallest living insect. Um, so the insects can get really, really tiny. And I just thought that was neat. Um, and we've got our photographs down here. We've got a carpenter bee, a uh, golden digger wasp, and an ant. So we've got a representation of each bees, wasp, and ant. So now we're gonna look at them individually. So uh, bees and wasps are divided into social slash semi-social or solitary. And what that refers to is how they raise their young primarily. So a social or a semi-social uh, hymenoptera will raise their young in groups and they will actually nurture them through the adult stages. Solitary bees and wasps um, don't, basically don't raise their young. They, they put them in individual cells and they, uh, and they provide them with food. They provide them with their, you know, everything that they need uh, to survive and then they leave them, they're on their own. Um, so those are the two, two main groups. Um, the majority of our uh, bee species that we have are actually solitary bees, even though the ones that we're most familiar with are the social bees, such as honeybees. And so how honeybees survive the winter? is in their hives. Um, you know, everyone knows what the beehive look like. They, uh, it's the queen and the workers only. The drones do die off. So we get the queen and the workers and the workers whole purpose is to uh, protect the queen and to make sure that she stays warm throughout the winter. And honeybees survive off their honey stores. So they are actually semi-active um, during the, the winter in that they, they are moving around inside the hive. They are eating the honey. So it's important if you do have hives and uh, most people you know, who are um, uh, beekeepers know that at a certain point they have to leave the honey. You can't just clear out all the honey for humans. You gotta leave a significant amount of it for the bees to survive the winter. 
Bumblebees are also uh, social bees. And with those, the, um, the workers and the previous year's queens die. And the newly mated queens actually dig into the soil. So they might have a, a, a hive that's somewhere um, above ground in the, the warmer months, but the newly mated queens actually bury themselves in the ground and that's where they stay for the winter. And when they emerge, they're often um, some of the first to emerge and the new queens have to go off entirely on their own in the spring and both find food from any of the early spring blooming plants and also find a nest so that they can set up a, uh, so they can lay those, their, their eggs and, um, and start the new colony. So there are a couple of different, there are lots of different, there's um, over 4,000 species of bees in uh, North America. So obviously we're not gonna go into all of them. Uh, two common carpenter bee species that we know of is the large carpenter bee and the small carpenter bee. Uh, and the small carpenter bee is uh, this image down here uh, in the lower left-hand corner. It's a really pretty metallic bee. So it, it's one of those ones that doesn't necessarily look like a bee, but it is. And again, only the females overwinter, but they overwinter as adults in stems. So pithy stems like hollow stems of uh, raspberry um, or some of the other wildflowers that you know you you see um, out and about that have a hollow stem, they will hide themselves inside them. And then in the spring, they actually transform those into nurseries. So they'll spend the winter in there as, a, as an adult. And then when the weather warms up, they, can, they uh, switch that pithy stem into a nursery where they start to lay those eggs. And we have a sweat bee. And these are another beautiful little bee. It's got bright green. Um, this one's got bright green with yellow and black on the back, but there are some that are all bright green, all bright blue, very iridescent, metallic. Uh, again, something that doesn't really look like a bee, but is, and a very beautiful, um, very cool native species. Uh, so the same thing with the, uh, as with the bumblebees, the native females overwinter in ground or in the soil. And the sweat bees classify as sort of a semi-social bee in that oftentimes sisters uh, of the hive will nest in proximity. So they're, they're technically creating individual uh, cells for themselves in the ground, but it'll all be in the same area. So in the spring when they emerge, it might look like they're all coming out of the same nest. Uh, so for solitary bees, that is the majority of our bees, and that includes ground and cavity nesting bees like leafcutter bees, mason bees, and mining bees. Um, and so these all overwinter as larvae in the cells that are built by the mated females in the fall. And those cells are, as I said before, they're, they're little individual pockets that are in either tunnels in the ground that they make. Um, they can make these, these really intricate tunnel systems that sometimes go a foot below the ground uh, or inside stems. And they create an individual cell for each of the larvae and they, they stuff it with pollen and nectar, um, depending on uh, you know, what they need. Sometimes they'll, they'll fill it up with insulation so that it stays nice and warm, like in the case of the leaf cutter bee, which you'll, you'll see the little leaf cutter bee down on the bottom, carrying the leaf uh, so that he can take it or she can take it into the cell and pack it in and keep it nice and warm. And they, uh, they emerge earlier in the year and they feed off of those provisions. And then in their, their final larval stage is how they stay until the spring. So they go through their couple of different uh, phases, uh, egg, pupa, larval instars. And it's in their final larval instar stage that they remain until the winter. Uh, until the winter ends. And oftentimes with these bees, the males are the first to emerge. So when the mated female lays her eggs in the fall, uh, she, she actually packs the tunnel in so that the, the female eggs that she's laying um, are down at the bottom and the male eggs that she lays are at the top. And 
they do have a way to determine the 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 mated female can determine which sex she's laying so if she's laying male or female she actually can figure that out and i can't remember how it is so if anyone wants to know yeah i have to look that up afterwards um and uh just another specific example of the solitary bees is uh, called the unequal cellophane bee which is this cute little guy here and um it's one of the first ones to emerge in the spring and these can be often found foraging on willow. So a lot of the very early plants that bloom uh, are, are really critically important for these uh, hibernating species when they come out. So wasps are uh, also broken down into social and solitary. And the social wasps are the ones that uh, most people are familiar with and don't like. We've got the paper wasps, the yellow jackets, and the bald face hornets fall into that category. And we have the uh, paper wasps down at the bottom and, of course, a bald face hornet. Um, so again, it's just uh, similar to some of the bee species, only a mated queen survives to hibernate through the winter and she will find any protected space. So this might, might be in the ground, but it might also just be under a log or in a tree cavit, uh, crevice. Sometimes you will find wasps nesting in a house. So if you in like say it's January and you see a wasp in your house, that is a, uh, a mated female who has overwintered in your house and got confused and thought that it was warm and that it was, uh, that it was spring. And so she has emerged to try to find herself uh, a nest. Um, so again, the queens emerge in the spring and they do all of the work of building a new nest and raising the young. They do not use the same nest each year though, so that's that might be useful information if you have a large nest uh, somewhere on your property. Um, just know that for the most part it will be vacated for the winter and they're not going to go back there. Um, there may be some uh, wasps that stay in there for a little while in the winter time so you do still have to be careful you decide you want to take that nest down but it's not going to be the um the whole nest for your solitary wasps that includes uh sand wasps mad mud daubers and cicada killers and for these guys the fertilized females create individual nests and uh, again like the solitary bees they do not rear their young they create their cells on the ground, pack them with food, and then the, narvae, the newly hatched larvae eat it until they're ready to overwinter. Um, and in this case, they're not necessarily packing their cells with uh, pollen and nectar. They're usually packing them with other critters. So in the case of the cicada killer, the food that gets packed in there for the little larvae to uh, devour over the winter is a cicada. So that's where the wasps become a very important predatory insects. Oftentimes the adult wasp is not the one that is uh, killing and eating pests, it's the, it's the larvae. So um, they do provide a really important uh, uh, <clears throat> garden aid. And also uh, similar with the, uh, the bees, usually the males emerge first uh, and they do emerge in the, as adults in the spring. So um, just because this nest is hanging off the edge of my house and I thought it was really cool, I wanted to include it. In case people aren't sure exactly what a bald faced hornet's nest looks like because it does look different than a paper wasp nest or a yellow jacket nest. Um, the bald faced hornet's nest is usually gonna be high above the ground in a tree or on a building. And it has this beautiful scallop pattern. Now these are, these can be aggressive uh, wasps and they can go after you, but you gotta you gotta give them credit for making a really beautiful house. And um, so there's just a couple of other angles of it. Um, and what you can see uh, from this lower middle one is the, the hole. So you're gonna have the beautiful scalloped edging and all the cells will be on the inside. And then you're gonna have their hole where they emerge in and out of. So this is a way that you can actually watch this uh, and until you when you no longer see activity coming in and out of this hole, that's when you know that it has basically been vacated for the winter. So if you were inclined to take the nest down, that would be when you would want to do it. Um, but I just think the nest is really beautiful. And so I, I'm actually probably going to just leave this on my house and see what happens to it. 
So ants, surprisingly, um, ants are uh, pollinators. They're, they're a very minor pollinator, but their primary importance comes in seed disbursement. And according to uh, this website, ants as seed dispersers, uh, approximately 35% of the herbaceous plants in the understory of forests in North America rely on ants for seed dispersal. So that's pretty huge. That means that the, these little creatures, these little industrious creatures, are responsible for helping to uh, propagate our plants in a different way. So this pollination, which is the precursor to creating the seeds. You need the pollination in order to have the seeds develop. And so the ants, they do a little bit of pollination just by trafficking back and forth on top of the plants, but then they will uh, be the ones to move the seeds around because there's a little uh, bit on the end of the seed that they carry off and they eat. And then they've just buried the seed and then that's just where it stays and it grows into a new plant. So some of the ants uh, build nests under uh, large rocks. Um, it's kind of, and so again, ants are, ants are kind of scary because they're really, really smart. Um, and I'm just glad they're really small because if they were bigger, they would definitely take over the world. Um, so they build nests under large rocks uh, or leaf piles to take advantage of the radiant heat. So the, the rock is gonna get warmed up by the sun in the winter time, and that's gonna help radiate the heat down through the nest. Um, and there are some ants that also winterize their nest, which means adding insulation and sealing holes, just like we do in, in our houses. We add insulation and we seal holes. Um, they burrow down deeper under the ground where the temperatures are more stable. And there are some that overwinter in our houses. Um, you might not see them because they're inside the walls or under the floors, but every once in a while, we all see ants here and there um, in our houses. And that's because it's nice and warm and toasty for them. All right, butterflies and moss, the Lepidoptera order. And so depending on the species, they can overwinter as either an egg, a chrysalis, a larvae, or an adult. Um, and there's, they all have different adaptations. Again, there's, there's hundreds of species. Um, so I'm only gonna go through a couple of them. And uh, so we'll start with the sphinx moth, uh, which has eggs buried under the leaf litter or in the sand. This is the snowberry clear wing. And it's the one that's commonly referred to as the hummingbird moth, which is just such a beautiful uh, creature and, um, and very, very cool. But uh, there's actually a lot of different sphinx moths. And uh, here are some other ones. The, uh, this, this one here, the second one is the gallium sphinx. This is the hydrangea sphinx. Um, so it's, uh, it's a predominantly hanging around hydrangea plants. And then the twin spotted sphinx moth, um, just really beautiful species of, uh, of animals. Swallowtail overwinter as a chrysalis. So you've got the little uh, chrysalis here that is attached to branches. So that's above the ground. And they, uh, they emerge to become a beautiful uh, swallowtail. This is a pipevine swallowtail. And of course there are several different species of swallowtails that we see flying around. And there's the Baron's buck moth, which is an endangered species. And um, it's, uh, it's one of the, the protected ones in um, the, the barren's habitat is, uh, it's, we're actually in uh, DCR, we've been trying to restore a number of barren's habitat because there are uh, over half or almost half of our terrestrial endangered species in Massachusetts rely on barren's habitat for survival. And Baron's buck moth is one of them. And this is actually a photograph of it uh, actually laying the eggs attached to the branches. So the eggs are directly attached to the branches. And that's how they'll overwinter. So of course, I have to talk about the woolly bear because everyone knows and loves the woolly bear, possibly one of the cutest caterpillars ever. And um, you know, we see these all the time. And what we don't often see is what they emerge into, which is a tiger moth, which is actually also a very beautiful uh, species. So it looks very different than the, the caterpillar that it comes from. 
but it's got these beautiful spots on it. Very, uh, very interesting looking, looking moth. And um, if you should ever see a black woolly bear, it's not a woolly bear, it's actually a giant leopard moth. And again, another stunning, stunning moth. I'm okay. I'm watching a show. Oh, what are you watching? About something about moths. Can you um can you mute yourself, whoever that is? Thank you. All right. So then uh, the morning cloak butterfly, which actually overwinters as an adult. And it can live for a surprising 10 months. It is extremely long lived for a butterfly. Many butterflies, and in fact, many insects only live for uh, either a few days or up to a few weeks. And this one actually lives for 10 months. And you, will act you can actually see this one uh, out in the winter. If we get a particularly warm day, it'll emerge from its uh, cracks and crevices that it hides in, tree cracks, um, you know, fence cracks, logs, that sort of thing. And they feed on the sap from the trees. Um, there's a broken branch, a winter storm breaks down a, a branch from a tree and then the sap starts to run. Then you can sometimes see the morning cloak butterfly feasting on that to, to help it to survive through the winter. And we do have a butterfly, another butterfly that migrates, the painted lady, which is a beautiful orange and brown and black uh, butterfly, but it looks very different than the monarch. But this actually follows no discernible migration patterns. So they've, they've tried to study it and the, the painted ladies just kind of go in, in random places, um, just further south where it's warmer, but there is no discernible pattern like there is with the monarchs where they all go to one central location in Mexico. Coleoptera, which is beetles. And beetles are actually the largest insect species on the planet. One fourth of all known animal species on the planet are beetles. Um, and they actually are the earliest uh, flies in beetles are the first pollinators of plants uh, dating back to about 150 million years ago. And there are still some species of plants such as magnolia and yellow water lily that require pollination from beetles. And they uh, visit up to 90% of flowering plants. So beetles, uh, they, they can definitely be destructive and there certainly are uh, a number of ones that are problematic, um, but they do also have a very important place in the food chain um, and as pollinators. And of course the beetles are one of those species that make great food for, uh, for birds and for other, other things. Um, so we want to try to encourage them and, uh, and you know, just let nature take its cycle. So they also overwinter in kind of different ways. The lady beetle or the ladybug, um, which is, uh, stays under bark or tucked into tree crevices. But of course, we all know you often find them just in your house. And on warm, warm winter days, you might see them clustering against the window, trying to get that sunlight. Um, and then they hide back into uh, various nooks and crannies when it gets cold again. Uh, the Japanese beetle, which is of course very destructive um, and not a pollinator, is just an example of, a, uh, uh, of one of the ways they overwinter. Um, they overwinter as grubs, as the little larvae. Um, and then the red milkweed beetle, which is what this picture is, uh, overwinters as grubs and larvae also. And um, they are, they might, uh, it's, it's unclear whether or not they definitively or just maybe overwinter within the root of the plant. Um, but they don't cause that much damage. And even though they do feed on the milkweed, they do not outcompete the monarchs. Order Diptera, which is flies. And the name Diptera actually means two wings. And that's how you can differentiate flies from bees. Bees have four wings. Uh, bees and wasp species have four wings. And this uh, image here is a uh, hoverfly, which looks very much like a bee. And they come in various sizes. This is kind of a big one. They, they're uh, even smaller ones too, but they definitely can resemble bees. But the way to tell them apart is that they just have the two wings versus the four of the, the, the bees. And uh, again, very, uh, their larvae are voracious eaters of garden pests, um, things like aphids and other 
Are there small, uh, small garden pests that are going to destroy the plants down the road? Uh, can be eaten by these flies. And they survive underground as pupa. So in uh, their sort of uh, pre-larval stage. And then they emerge in the spring. Interesting note about flies is that chocolate must be pollinated by midges, which is a type of fly, a small net-like fly in the really hard to pronounce um, family. Um, it's a really long word and there's various species of other really long words, but it's basically the chocolate fly. And if you have no fly, you have no chocolate. So just uh, just to give a little shout out to to the flies, we do we do need them if we if we want to continue on with our our delicious treats. So the last order I'm going to talk about is Choroptera, which is bats, and there are over 300 species of fruit. Uh, spe 300 species of uh, fruit depend on bats for pollination. Now. The bats that we have in New England, we have nine native species and none of our specific bat species are pollinators. So they kind of don't fit into this program, which is called pollinators in winter, but uh, there are bat species, the lesser long-nosed bat and the Mexican long-nosed bat, which are both federally endangered, which are important pollinators of the agave plant, which is famous for being the plant that tequila is made out of. Um, and around the world, bats do pollinate uh, flowers and our important pollinators. Uh, but the main reason why I wanted to bring them up is because I like to take any opportunity I can to talk about bats because uh, five of our native New England bat species are endangered. And they have uh, one of the main problems, which is white nose syndrome, is, uh, is because of their hibernation. And so it does sort of fit into this program for that reason. So here in uh, Massachusetts, in New England, we have two different categories of bats. There are tree bats and cave bats. And our three tree bats are the hoary, eastern red, and silver-haired bat. And our cave bats are the big brown, the little brown, eastern small-footed, northern long-eared, which is what this picture is, the Indiana bat, and the tricolored bat. And bats also, uh, they either migrate or they hibernate. And uh, these, the next three slides are actually specifically from um, the DCR bat biologist. So I just wanted to uh, give full credit. These are, not, these are not my slides, these are borrowed slides. Uh, but so our tree bats are the ones that migrate and they don't migrate that far. They basically migrate um, just as far as they need to, to find food. So they, they migrate no, no more than 200 miles from their, um, from their homes, from their summer homes. And uh, bats learn their migration routes. They learn them as juveniles from the adults. So it's not something that is, uh, so like in the case of the monarchs, where you don't have uh, multiple generations following each other, you just have one generation who just instinctively knows where to, where to fly. Uh, bats actually do learn where their migration patterns are from their, from their family. The rest of the bats are uh, hibernating bats and they hibernate in caves or in uh, rocky crevices, um, sometimes you know, inside uh, houses, inside sheds, if there's little small enclosed spaces. Any place that the bat is going to, that the bats are going to roost is called a hibernacula. And so these are some of the examples of places where they would hide. Um, the majority of a population, so say of uh, little brown bats, so the majority of all the little brown bats in New England would be hibernating in one spot. And that is what becomes a major problem with the white nose syndrome, which I'll get to in just a second just finish up on the hibernation, the uh, inside the caves and inside these little crevices and holes that they hide in, they go to these certain areas because they have a stable temperature and humidity. It does have to be uh, cool temperatures, 
not too cold and they do need a little bit of humidity, um, a little bit of moisture, but the levels must be stable. And so this of course becomes a problem when you have with, with any of the species, with any of the uh, animals that we've talked about, when you have major temperature fluctuations through the winter, if you have like a 70 degree day in February, that can cause problems for these animals that are hibernating because it tricks them into thinking that the spring has come. And if they emerge and then are hit by uh, a major frost um, or you know, a major snowstorm, then you could wipe out uh, an entire generation. Um, and so the, the timing of the uh, hibernation for these guys is usually October to April, but again, it is somewhat weather dependent. So white nose syndrome is a fungal disease um, that was first found in caves in New York and th the fungal, the fungus thrives in cool dark spaces. So it thrives in exactly the places where these bats are hibernating. And um, it travels very easily. It travels through spores. It can travel on people's clothing. Uh, they believe that it originally came over here from Europe on hiking on a cave divers clothing and equipment. And uh, it has really uh, played havoc with the, the bats in North America. Uh, all four of our bat species that uh, winter in caves or mines were listed as endangered because of white nose syndrome. Uh, and these, these next couple of statistics are pretty sad. The little brown bat was, was once the most abundant bat species in Massachusetts has declined by more than 99%. So remember, like I said, a lot of these uh, species, the entire species will roost in one place. And if white nose syndrome gets into that one cave, it can wipe out the entire species um, or close to the entire species. One hibernacula in Massachusetts had 10,000 little brown bats before white nose syndrome. And after the white nose spores were introduced, only 14 were found alive. So it's pretty serious. It is a very serious disease. Um, it has impacted really, really all of our cave dwelling bats. Um, and what it does, the, re the way that it kills is because it disrupts them while they're hibernating. So they, the bats, when they're in their caves, they're, they're sleeping, they're going, you know, they're dormant. Um, and they're, that provides them with the opportunity to reserve their fat stores. Um, it's what they have to live off of. They do wake up a little bit. They wake up to shift around. So just like uh, honeybees in a hive, they, they do move around a little bit and shift uh, for warmth and kind of move, move bats in from like the outside to the inside. Um, and they also do have to still drink, which is why they need the dampness in the caves. So they need to have a little bit of water. Um, but the white nose syndrome disrupts them and causes them to wake up more frequently. And the more they stay awake and the more they, they shiver to try to get, uh, bring their body temperature up, they're losing those fat stores. And so the way they actually end up dying is by starving to death because they they've, haven't been able to preserve themselves as they need to, to get through the winter. And unfortunately, sometimes bats who do survive through the winter um, with the white nose syndrome can also get on their wings and, uh, and cause their wings to deteriorate. And so you might have a bat that made, managed to make it through the winter um, with still having some fat stores, but if it has too many holes in its wings, then it's not gonna be able to fly and it's gonna end up dying. So it, it is, it is uh, pretty, pretty serious um, for our bats. And unfortunately there's, they, they've been studying it and there is no cure, there is no uh, real, uh, good news on it necessarily, um, other than just trying to encourage people to do things like if you put up bat houses, so the bat houses are generally, um, you know, they're gonna be a little more protective. They're not gonna hopefully not have the spores in them. And so you can do that to help them out. Um, anything that you're doing with like, if you ever do go into caves or any place like that, just you know, make sure you wash everything before you go in, you know, your, your your equipment, your shoes, your clothing, um, and uh, anything that we can do to help uh, to protect pollinators in general 
is going to help the bats because they do live off of those insects. So the insects that are, we're going to be promoting uh, by protecting pollinators are going to help the, the, the little bats um, to survive as much as possible. So some more ways that you can help overwintering pollinators is that really the best thing you can do is reduce your workload. Uh, leave everything in the fall. Save your, your yard cleanup until the spring. Uh, those uh, dead dry stems that, you know, they don't look so pretty in the garden, but they're actually providing habitat. Those are uh, great habitat for cavity nesters, um, as well as the seed heads are gonna provide food for birds throughout the winter. Leaf litter on the ground is going to provide cover and insulation for the ground nesters. And then you've got, if you've got bare patches uh, in your, your lawn that, you know, maybe you don't, your, your grass died off, um, you don't necessarily have to replant the grass, just leave it open because there are a lot of uh, uh, ground nesting bees, especially bees and wasps that, and beetles that need sand and loose sandy soil, um, piles of uh, logs and yard debris. So all of the stuff that you think looks icky in your yard is actually great for the wildlife. So I just recommend taking it easy. Just give yourself the, uh, the season off and wait until uh, well into spring before you start cleaning things up. Most of the critters are gonna emerge, uh, start emerging when it gets uh, to be above 50 degrees consistently for at least four to five days. Um, so if you, know, if you have one day that's 70 degrees and the next day is 30, that's not gonna do it. So you wanna give them a little bit more time. Uh, something else that a lot of people have started doing um, which is great is called no mow may and um, that's basically where you just don't mow your lawn the whole month of may just give your lawn that that break and don't start mowing till june because then you're again you're just providing more habitat and more time for those those critters to emerge and all of those early blooming plants like the violets the dandelions uh, the little things that you know, some people don't like in their perfectly manicured green lawns uh, are, are critical food sources for our pollinators as they are uh, emerging from their, their winter um, hibernation. So yeah, just take it easy on yourself, man. Take, take the whole time from like September to May, take it off. Just don't even work, don't do anything in your yard. Um, and then uh, always use native plants whenever possible. Um, we, there are a lot of species that are specialized uh, and they only use certain plants as host plants. Um, so for example, the, uh, the great fritillary butterfly has uh, the, the larvae only survives on violets. So you've got to have violets in your yard if you want to have uh, great fritillaries. So you know, very, everyone's again familiar with the monarch with uh, milkweed being their host plant, but there's hundreds of species of insects that rely on very specific plants. So um, use native plants whenever possible. They also have better nutrition. Um, I like to think of it as, <clears throat> so even though you, know, you might have all the beautiful ornamental plants and yes, the pollinators go into them, but if they're not native plants, they're more like fast food. It's like, it's like eating a, a home cooked meal versus eating McDonald's. So your native plants is gonna be your good, healthy home cooked meal. It's gonna give them the right nutrition, the right amount of calories, the right amount of energy. Whereas if you, if you only provide them with the you know, uh, alien species of plants, uh, the decorative lawn plants that are you know, pretty but don't have uh, the, the nutritional value, that's like feeding them McDonald's. So whenever possible, plant native plants. And here are some links. Um, if you want more information, uh, I've got some local links listed up there. Um, certainly there's a lot of information on the MassDuck.gov website. Our natural resources and, uh, and wildlife pages have a lot of information. Just put these, um, you know, some keywords into the search bar. You can find a lot on there. Um, there is a, uh, the state actually has a pollinator plan which you can look up where the, the state agencies are trying to do more to protect um, native pollinators. Uh, the Athol Bird and Nature Club, which is a, is a, it's a great resource. Uh, Dave Small, who is the expert on uh, Lepidoptera, is a, uh, he's the president of that. And so they have a lot of great information. 
Um, and then this is a website uh, for people specifically in Western Massachusetts to encourage people to make pollinator gardens. Uh, a couple of national, um, just sort of general links are the Xerxes uh, Society, which is a, um, a, an insect uh, research and uh, protection organization and pollinator.org, which has all kinds of good information as well. Uh, and the last thing I wanna point out is this bee, which is a squash bee. And I just think he's too cute for words. Um, so it is a, it's a, one of those specialized bees. They only uh, forage on the squash plants. So the you know, squash, pumpkins, cucumbers, all of that good stuff. Um, anything that has those big open yellow plants and you're gonna find the squash bees there. And um, they, they do actually nest in the ground near where those plants are. So if you've got, you've got a garden where you regularly have a squash patch, you're um, probably down deep down in that ground, about a foot underneath the soil is going to be an overwintering colony of squash bees. So um, that, is, uh, that is where I will end. And I will leave this link up if people want to copy it. And I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Um, but Justin has to come back and open up the uh, Unmute everybody. So, uh, one more thing I will say is this little squash bee has a yellow patch on its nose. Some bees have a white patch on their nose. Um, that's generally the indicator of a male bee. Okay, let's see, I can, I can check the chat. Um, yeah, so if, uh, if anyone has questions, they want to put them into the chat or uh, Justin, now you're back if you want to unmute people. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, I believe if anyone has a question, I think you can unmute yourself. Or just, yeah, like Nancy said, type it into the chat. Speaking of pollinators, I've got a mosquito in here, it looks like. Am I off right now? And it's only the female mosquitoes that bite, by the way. Mm -hmm. So, well, no one has any questions? You covered everything? Hmm. I guess. Oh, yes. Looks like there's one comment in the chat. Uh, so Sharon asks, the mated queen hibernates, but workers die. How does the queen get more workers? Um, great question. Uh, they're, they're inside her. Um, so she, she lays those eggs when she emerges, and those eggs become the new workers. So in the spring, um, when she you know, re rebuilds a nest and reestablishes the colony for the year, um, they will eventually grow. She'll have both uh, males and females already as uh, fertilized eggs inside her, and then they will they will turn into the workers in the following year. Oh, sorry, sorry, Kathy. <laughs> it said Sharon. Anyone else? No other questions? Okay. Okay. Well, All right. Well, I will. Thanks again, uh, everyone. I will stop sharing. Yeah.